Welcome to I've Decided Special Session on Effective Communication Strategies. Today's featured speaker is Daryl Carlson of the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Daryl Carlson. I'm with the Alzheimer's Association. Been with them for about six years. Started with the Alzheimer's Association after we moved back from Alaska. I did missionary work for 15 years, mostly in Alaska. And when I just, when we moved back, my mother, my mother-in-law, my wife's mother had aggressive cancer. She passed away and then just found out almost like two months afterwards that her dad had dementia. And so we sort of knew it, we got thrust into the caregiving role and we decided to stay in Illinois and then found eventually the, this job has been a really good, perfect match. So I walk this, I know what it's like to be a caregiver and how difficult it can be. And I love this program, Effective Communication Strategies, because I have a degree in communications. I have some advanced coaching and communication certifications, very interested in communication, especially I'm interested in when communication goes wrong. So when I first learned this program, and since I didn't know anything, I was assuming, hey, dementia, that must be a really, you must learn to have some kind of really special, unique things I never heard of before to communicate with someone with dementia. And as I was learning this program, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is just advanced communication techniques. That's what this is. And so not only are you going to learn a little bit about dementia, how to communicate with someone who has dementia, but along the way, you're going to learn things that are going to help you just become a better communicator. And I'll point those out, give a couple of those kinds of examples as we go as well. But this program in specifically is dealing with um, working with someone who has dementia. Oh, let's... There we go. And so what we want to cover today, ah, a little slow. We wanted to talk about the communication challenges that do take place with someone throughout the course of the disease. Uh, tomorrow at the library at noon, I'll be doing a program just about Alzheimer's and dementia, going a little deeper in that. We'll talk, I'll talk about a few basic things today, but there, it's a progressive brain disease. And so we want you to be able to understand how communication changes as this program. Did that thing, oh, I'm good, okay. Um, so we also then wanna talk about how do you decode those messages people are trying to send you. So you can communicate with them and respond in a way that's helpful. Because if any, if any of you have worked with someone who has dementia, you know, connecting and communicating can be difficult. So we wanna make that easier for you. And then you, well, I want you to have strategies so that you can communicate at each stage of the disease. Because it's a progressive disease, what you need to do changes as the disease progresses. So that's sort of what we're gonna cover here as well, okay? But let's start really quickly reviewing what communication is. Because communication is something we do so much that sometimes we forget that it's actually a complicated process. It may be sort of simple, but there are a lot of things that happen, okay? So just real quickly, we can remember that communication is, you know, it begins in our own minds. We have to think and process and figure out what's going on around me. What do I want to do? What do I want to say? Then you actually have to execute on that. You've got to do something. You've got to say it, right? And then from there, it's got to go through the room. So if it's a noisy room or people getting up and moving around, you have to sort of black out the distraction. And then the person has to receive it. They have to try to figure out what in the world is this person saying? Or what are they doing? And then how am I gonna respond? And then they give feedback because you don't know if you've communicated right until they give you feedback so you know if they got it or not, okay? So when it comes to communicating with someone with dementia, you're just dealing with someone who cannot hold up their end of this communication loop because there's multiple pieces to this. And even within that, just to think about what you wanna say and do, your brain has to do a lot of work, okay? So there's a lot going on in communication. And in communication, most of what we communicate is more than words. Language is important, the words we use, but really it's the nonverbals, it's the tone of voice, it's the body language, it's the facial expressions. All of that communicates. Because I can say to my wife, I love you, or I can say, I love you. <laughs> two whole different worlds right there between those two same words, right? So we're gonna go, so that's a little review and we're gonna go in deeper. But as we start, I always like to tell you the four main things that I want you to get out of this whole thing. These four things will hit as we go along, 
but I want them to stand out to you. So you really remember these four things. These four things will help you communicate better and it will help you definitely communicate with someone who has dementia. There's not even a slide for it. We'll hit it as we go, but I want you to remember the first thing you wanna remember is you can only control yourself. In communicating, you must remember you can only control you. You can't control other people. Jeez, I wish I could, <laughs> but I can't. So this, you wanna remember that. When you're working with someone with dementia, you really can't control how they see things. You can only control yourself. The next thing you wanna do with dementia or with anyone is you wanna meet people with their, where they're at. Join them in their reality. However they see whatever is going on, join them there. And that goes a long way. We'll talk more about that. The third thing you wanna always do is pay attention to all the communication signals they're giving you. It's more than just words. And as you'll find out in a moment, the ability to use words with dementia disappears relatively quickly. Okay, so pay attention to all the information they're giving you. And the fourth thing is always bring respect to every conversation that you have. Okay, those are the four things. And we'll touch on them as we go, but I wanted to highlight it because if you do those four things, it makes communicating better, and especially if you're communicating with someone with dementia. So let's talk a little bit about how communication changes through the course of this disease. I do want to highlight, is anyone here not familiar with Alzheimer's or dementia? Anyone feel like they don't really? Get, okay, most people do know. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. I always have to say every program I do that dementia is not a disease. Dementia is a diagnosis that a doctor will give, but it's just diagnosing a set of symptoms. It doesn't tell you what's causing those symptoms. So anytime you hear the word dementia, I really would love it if you would think what's causing this dementia. It's just like when we hear the word cancer. What do you think of when you hear the word cancer? I've got cancer. What's the first thing you ask? I'm not that. <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, the next second question then is what kind of cancer is it? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with this? I need to know what kind it is so I know how to attack it. Okay, so same thing, dementia, what's causing it? Um, and so it's a, um, there's lots of different things that can cause dementia. Vascular dementia, stroke is a, one form of dementia, but Alzheimer's disease is the most common. And it is a progressive brain disease. So as the disease progresses, symptoms get worse and you can die from Alzheimer's disease directly, or you can die with it from a different complication. Okay, that's really quick, very fast overview. But when we talk about the progression of Alzheimer's disease, we talk about it in three stages because three is a little easier. Some, science, some uh, occupational therapists will use five stages. Some doctors will use seven stages. We just talk three. We got the early or the mild stage, you have the moderate or the middle stage, and then you have the late stage or the severe stage. So notice a lot of times when people hear the word dementia or Alzheimer's, they think the first thing that comes to their mind is late stage. Nursing home, can't communicate. That's where all the fear comes in. That's where all the stigma is at. So just know that if you catch this disease early in the very, very beginning, there's mild symptoms, and then it goes to moderate, and then it goes to severe, okay? So when it comes to communication, all that is introduction. In the early mild stage, you can, they can still communicate thoughts and feelings. They can still use words relatively well. They may have a hard time finding a word, may need to take a little more time, may have a little more difficulty making decisions, but they can still pretty much engage and communicate normally. And that's really important to remember that, okay? Uh, middle stage, that's where a lot of behavior challenges come in. That's where a lot of struggle is because that's where things start to really pick up and become more challenging. They can still use basic words and sentences, but the words may not mean the same thing as you think, and it may be more difficult. They'll rely more on body language than they were before. They might start doing things they never did before. Good church going people might start swearing like sailors. If they have a native language, they may start to speak that exclusively and forget they know English. Um, things like that can happen in that middle stage, but they still need that emotional connection. And they still know that they're a grown adult that wants to be respected, even though they may start to behave like a teenager or a toddler even. But then late stage, is they can still respond and use some very, very basic words, but they still need that connection, even in that late end stage, okay? 
So that's just an overview of how communication goes. If you have questions as we go, feel free. You can interrupt me anytime. I'm totally fine with that, okay? So looking now a little deeper, we'll look at the early stage for just a few minutes, a lot more time in the middle, and then some time at the late stage. So difficulty finding the right word, that is very common in this early stage. Um, taking longer to speak or to respond, that's very common. Withdrawing from conversation because it takes longer, because things are starting to get more confusing, because they're embarrassed. Maybe they don't want to face it. Maybe so they'll withdraw some more in the early stages. And there'll be some struggle in making decisions. Okay. But that's sort of the early stage, but they still can communicate. So let's look at what we can do. Um, I don't know. Do you want me to play the video and see if they can hear it online? Yeah. All right. I got one person online. I want you to give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. Okay, we'll see. And if this doesn't work, it's okay. Yeah, see, you guys can't hear. That's okay. We don't need the. We don't need that. So that's Martha Turney. She works with the Alzheimer's Association, and all she was talking about is that in this early stage, the simplest thing is ask, talk to them about what is comfortable for them in communicating. A good example is if they're having a hard time finding that right word, do they want you to jump in and help them find it? Or would they prefer you just wait and because they, they want to find it? Some everyone's different. Okay. But just asking directly, what's the easiest way to communicate with you? Uh, do you like phone calls or talking on the phone too difficult? Do you still like to do email? Do you want in person? How do you want to communicate? So that's something you can do in that early stage. You still want to keep your sentences very straightforward and clear. Don't talk down, but just realize, let me do like one thought at a time as I'm talking. Let me start to limit these pronouns and stop referring to them. You know, sometimes we'll say, we'll talk about Bob, and then you'll just say he, 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 he for the rest of the next five minute conversation, but they may get lost. So you want to refer to Bob more often by name as you go through it, okay? You want to leave more time for conversations. When you're working with someone with dementia, patience on your part and taking time to do things, that just increases. You'll need more patience and more time as the disease progresses. And that's okay. Um, and then you want to include them in the conversations that are affecting their life. And I can't tell you how many times we speak with people who are in this early stage and they know and remember when people talk over them or they're here with their loved one and the doctor is talking to the loved one about them. And they're like, I'm standing right here. And they remember it enough to tell us later, you know, it's still the early stage. They still might be able to drive. Maybe you got to watch the driving is a tricky one. But in the early stages, they're diagnosed early. That's still maybe possible. OK, so you want to include them. You want to avoid making assumptions. Now, this is always important. Um, our brain likes to make assumptions. Our brain likes shortcuts. And so if we see someone who's a certain way, a certain behavior, we like to assume things about them so we can just size them up and know who are they and do I wanna to talk to them? Do I not wanna to talk to them? So our brains assume a lot. You really wanna slow that down and turn that off when you're working with someone with dementia, especially. But it's just good to not make assumptions whenever possible. You wanna to talk directly to them. And by that, I mean, you wanna make sure you have eye contact and you're talking to them and making sure they're still tracking because you can watch their face and if they start to wander off like or they look confused so you just want to be direct and face to face because if you're sometimes you know you're doing something and you're yelling across the room at them that used to work before but probably not anymore so you want to make sure you've got their attention talking right to them okay laughing is good this disease is a death sentence it is we don't have a way to stop it we don't have a way to slow it down yet so to get this diagnosis of Alzheimer's is there's grief involved, there's denial involved, but there still can be humor and take their cue. If they do something silly and they laugh, you can laugh. You know, you want to enjoy each other still, okay? And then always be honest and communicate and stay connected. I always tell people, if you have a friend, especially if it's a friend who's been diagnosed, or a friend who has a loved one being diagnosed. It's very easy in that friend role to assume, oh, this is serious. 
The family needs, I don't want to give them space. I don't want to interfere or I don't know what to do. And you may feel like maybe I want to pull back. I encourage you don't pull, push in. They need you. They need friends. They need help. And this program right here will help you be comfortable in helping out. Okay. So just stay that, stay connected. It's really important in that communication, and especially also in the early stage, because it is a fatal disease and it is, you're dealing with grief and processing through grief. Communication is really important through that. And everyone grieves differently and at different times. So that keep that in mind as you communicate and be patient with each other, right? So that's the early stage, really simple, some basic things. Any questions about early stage stuff? No? Okay. Middle stage, this is where things get interesting and we'll have several different tactics you can use that we'll talk about. Um, and I didn't mention it before, but that tips booklet you have contains all this information and then it also has some extra stuff too. So you can go through that and be some notes in there for other things you can use in the future. So in this middle stage, you're gonna find that they're gonna have increased difficulty finding the right word, okay? That'll happen more often. You might need to sort of interject and off give them the word they're looking for somewhere in this middle stage. They'll just take over and help them, right? Using familiar words repeatedly. So my father-in-law, um, shortly in, when he was in this middle stage, we went to the um, assisted living to visit and it was the 4th of July and we said, hey dad, it's Daryl, your son-in-law, your, your daughter, Laura. Uh, happy 4th of July. We just came to say hi and see how you're doing. And he goes, oh, great. Uh, did you, you know, uh, go, did you, did you see the boom booms? I've never heard boom boom before in reference to fireworks, but he completely created something to try to get across what he was saying. And that's very common with dementia, okay? A lot easier for them to lose their train of thought. You also want to understand that it's a brain disease. So brain cells die, gaps in the brain literally form, but the brain is so amazing. It tries to work around it. It, you know, short-term memory disappears. It will reach into long-term memory to try to figure out what's going on to make sense of it. That takes a lot of effort. That takes a lot of energy. It's easier to lose a train of thought. Sometimes because it's so much work, they won't hear every word you say like maybe every other word or just, they're only gonna catch every third word you say. So that also makes communicating difficult for them. Um, they're gonna speak less frequently. You talk a lot less, that's gonna happen. Uh, this is a really important one, communicating through behavior rather than through words. You need to remember, and I think we know this, but behavior is communication. Sometimes when we, someone does something that ticks us off, we don't think of it as communication. We just think I'm mad. <laughs> how dare you do that? But people do things, their behavior, they do it out of how they think and out of how they feel. And they're trying to get something out of you, whatever. So that's always true with everyone. But with most people, they know what they're doing and you can hold them responsible because they're adults and they're fully functional. But if they have a dementia, just realize, hey, they're trying to communicate something. Even if they get mad and they swing at you, realize what are they trying to communicate with this behavior, okay? So that's gonna be something they're really gonna do because their ability to use words really diminishes. It's their ability to use words effectively are going to be long gone by this middle stage. They'll still talk, but effective use of those words are gonna be not there really, okay? Um, so remember that and it's always really important as you're working with someone in this middle stage and they have good days, they have bad days, but if they ever have a moment in which their symptoms get worse quickly, you want to consult the doctor because there could be a medical condition going on to cause that. The biggest culprit is a urinary tract infection. UTIs get in the bloodstream, get into the brain and start to make symptoms worse quickly. With my father-in-law, uh, it got to the place where, you know, one time Scott was driving him somewhere and they were having a decent conversation. And all of a sudden he just started making no sense at all whatsoever. And by this time, we already knew what, what this is. So he just turned on the turn signal, <laughs> took a detour to the hospital. Antibiotics aren't working. Let's try something else. The UTI flared up again. Okay, so just be aware that that can happen. Or medication interactions. You can be, and this is actually a general tip overall. You can be on a set of medications for a long time. 
and not have side effects. And all of a sudden your body goes, I'm done. I had enough. And you start having side effects that are known, but you never had them before. Okay. So just be aware of that as well. And that could be the case with dementia. So be, be aware of those things. Okay. So Bev is a caregiver support group facilitator. And in, in this video, she just shares how couples, especially their relationship is such that normally quick interactions or with kids, with my kids, they're little, it's back and forth fast. And if they, one kid says something and triggers the parent and then the, then the kid is triggered and you're right away, it's quick. But with dementia, you need to realize you got to slow down and you can only control yourself. That's the point she makes in the video. You can't control them. So if things aren't working, you want to change how you're, what you're doing. This is important in all communication, okay? It's very easy for us if we're communicating with someone and they're not getting it. Sometimes we just like to talk louder, <laughs> say the same thing over again, but they're still not getting it. If they're not understanding what you're saying, you, if you wanna be a great communicator, you change up how you're saying it, what you're doing to try to get your point across in a different way. That's always true, but especially with someone who has dementia. Okay, so let's talk about different strategies, different general principles and examples of each. So here's one good strategy and one good principle. You want to be gentle in your approach, okay? And there's lots of different ways to be gentle in your approach. You wanna come from the front, okay? You wanna say who you are and call them by name. Now this feels strange. And if you notice in the example of my father-in-law on the 4th of July, that's what I did. By that point, you know, so what you have to understand by this point, especially anytime you walk in the room for at least a moment, they're going to be like, who is this person? Am I safe? An instant fear. Am I safe? Who is this person? What's going on? If you call them by name immediately, that very subconsciously will give them a sense of, well, I don't know who that is, but they know me, so this might be okay. And then you tell them who you are and then maybe why you're there. And you may feel weird, but they'll appreciate it. And when I did that for my father-in-law, he didn't miss a beat. He's like, oh, great, good to see you, okay? So call them by name, approach from the front. Their peripheral vision begins to shrink, so you don't wanna come at them from the side because if you just pop up right in their field of vision, I mean, I say this, I mean, they could be right there. And for that feels like this to them and you might get a backhand, okay? Um, but you wanna maintain eye contact as well. And you wanna be at their level. And so this is important because no one likes to be talked down to. Does anyone here like to have someone talk down to them, right? Realize if you're talk, if you get close to someone, and I normally would do this, but since I'm on camera, it's not going to work. If I walked right up to you and got within really inside your comfort zone, it was a little too, too close, and I started talking to you, you might be okay for a moment. Eventually, you're going to be like, get out of my space. And then also, I am literally talking down to you. Now, normally, you'd sort of know, and it's not that big of a deal. But for them, that can really be subconsciously intimidating. So if you stop and you get at their level, get on one knee, sit next to them and give them enough space and just talk to them at eye level, that feels so much more comfortable and it's so much easier for them. So they don't feel attacked, right? Or they don't feel like you're trying to dominate them. It's a subtle thing. You want to avoid criticizing, correcting and arguing. This is hard. In the middle stage, they're not going to be connected with reality. Their ability to know what's happening is not there. So their brain is grasping at whatever memory they have and try to make it fit, which is why if it's your grandmother and they won't say, you can't be my granddaughter, I don't have grandchildren, you must be my best friend because you're my age, even though it's 80 to 30 or whatever. They're just trying to make it fit. So don't argue with it. You wanna go with it, okay? Um, pay attention to your tone of voice. You may be frustrated. They're going to ask the same question over and over and over again. And that's okay. Every time they ask that question, it's the very first time they ask the question and you can answer it. Just try your best. You're not going to do it perfectly. You're going to be frustrated, but that's okay. Do your best to keep yourself calm because they'll pick up on the tone of voice and that's how they're, we're, they're going to react to that. Okay. So that's this next video. It's just Rebecca's talking about her mom old school 
you know, they get in a heated argument. Mom's asked the same question a dozen times. This is the first time I'm asking, what's your problem? And then Rebecca just had to get to the place where she goes, okay, here we go. New phase of relationship. Sure, that was the first time, no problem, okay? So you just have to get, you can only, you can't control them. You can only control how you're going to react, okay? So another way, another strategy is what we said in the beginning. Here are some more examples of it. You want to join them in their reality. Wherever they're at, join them there. Now, in this slide, this is sort of like the key formula to also deal with behaviors that are troublesome for you. And you'll have a lot of them in the middle stages. And so this formula is, first, you want to assess, you meet them where they're at. Whatever they're saying, whatever's going on, you assess their needs, okay? Are they hurt? Are they in pain? They may not be able to tell you. Pay attention to all the signals. Are they favoring one side? Do you know that they haven't drank water for about six hours and they're probably thirsty? Uh, maybe they're hungry. You know, what are their needs? Try to guess. Play detective. So you get to be detective too when you're a caregiver. Okay. You want to assess their needs, make sure of pain, there's nothing like that going on. You want to let them know you hear them, you hear their concerns. Just agree with them. It's okay if they're wrong. Okay because everyone wants to feel like they're being listened to. No one likes it if, some, if you're dumping your problems and someone ignores you and just tries to fix it. How many people like that? I don't know many that like that. They don't either. So you want them to feel like you understand, like you're listening to them. You want to connect with the emotion of what's going on, okay? When you connect with their emotion of what's going on, you can then give them a brief answer just brief, and then you respond to the emotions. And at that point, you can add a bullet point, redirect. You, after you respond, don't try to redirect them until you really responded to the emotions behind what's going on, because they will fight you. Now, this isn't a perfect formula because every per if you met one person with Alzheimer's, you've met one person who's had Alzheimer's because everybody's different and everyone has different days and different you know, what's, yeah, it's always different every single day. But that's, so this is a good formula for dealing with behaviors as well. But the main thing is join them in their reality. Now, I'm going to make the connection to everyday life. If you want to just connect with someone, that you do the same thing. Just the idea of joining them in their reality. If you, have you guys heard the term rapport, having rapport with someone? That's what this is. Here's a little trick, a little factoid about human beings. We humans like to hang out with other people that we think are like us, at least in the ways that are important to us. So if I feel like you're like me, we've got a lot in common, then I'm going to want to hang out with you some more. That's rapport. That's normal. And so anytime you want to connect with anybody, always think about, you know, how much rapport do you have? Don't dive into a controversial subject with someone if you have no rapport with them. That's a lose, 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 lose situation. But if you have that connection, you have that relationship, if you feel like you're similar enough, then maybe then you can dive into that controversial topic and have a fruitful conversation. Does that make sense? It's that level of rapport. So that's just a way to connect that to other things. So here's another strategy in the basic, in the middle stage. You want to keep it slow and basic, okay? You want to slow down, short sentences, one thought at a time very basic words. Um, you want to speak slower. Because again, like I said, their brain is working really hard to keep up with what's going on. So you may feel like you're talking at a normal rate of speed, but for them, you may be talking too fast. Or when you walk up to them, try to walk a little slower. Otherwise, they may feel like you're running at them. Okay. So keep it slow and basic. Uh, if you're if one person at a time, you can, a very small group, when we visited dad, we let the kids come in the room for literally a minute just so he can see them. And then we shush them out because it was too much for him. Okay. And there was a time, uh, the last time my wife took dad to the doctor with her brother, they had to get him in the car and he was in his wheelchair. And so, okay, dad, we're going to pick you up under your arms. And then when you stand up, we're going to have you twist. And we want you then just to scoot. Stop yelling at me. Okay. They were going slow. 
but because it was too fast and too many commands all at this it was he was just overwhelmed it was too much okay another thing to do is limit distractions uh, sometimes if they're still in their home and if you notice they seem agitated often pay attention to their environment sometimes if the windows open maybe the lawnmower is running outside and it's noisy now we normally tune out distractions pretty easily some easier than others us guys who are married can tune out distractions much better than our wives can um but so but they really can it's really hard for them so or you know the tv's up too loud or the tv's been on and it's just background noise and maybe they always had the tv on but now it's too much or if they're in their original home and the living room is full of knickknacks and wonderful things from all the years of their life maybe now it's just too much stimulation and they're looking at all these things and they don't know what these things are and who do they belong to maybe you can just clear out the living room and just put up a few simple things and it'd be less distracting for them so those kind of distractions play into it as well and then by this time if they can't find the word you usually can just help them figure it out and they don't care Okay, in the early stage, they might get mad at you, but here that's fine. Okay. All right, you ready? Here's another one. You want to give multiple cues. Like I said, the language drops off. It's not really very effective anymore. So you want to give visual cues. You want to gesture more. You want to point to what you want. If you want to say, hey, it's time to eat, have a seat, and I'll make you a sandwich, you say, hey, Let's have a seat. You point, you can pull the chair out, do the little half squat with them, you know, sort of show this is what I want you to do. And that just helps them figure out what's going on here. Okay. Visual cues, gestures. If they can still read okay, depending on where they're at, you can write things down. Um, you want to avoid sudden movement, and as I said before, or coming up too quickly out of their peripheral vision. Um, you want to put ants, put question, put answers into your questions. This is a fun one. So part of the issue with that, if you wanna prevent frustration, you want to always give them a choice. Now, see, here's the trick though. They can't make decisions really. They get to the place where it's all overwhelming, but the problem is they don't really know they can't make decisions. And the last thing they want is to feel like you're just bossing them around all the time. So they want choice. So what do you do? You give them two options, own only two options. And the interesting thing is the last thing out of your mouth, very well. Will be the thing. They your questions like that. That's a way that can be really helpful. Giving them a choice, the last thing they say, that actually has some effect in re regular life as well. Scientists who are bored and have nothing else to do apparently study these kinds of things. And we know that when you're asking someone to do you a favor, how you ask someone makes a big difference, okay? And so um, let me, this example. Uh, we got a big, huge, giant stand-up freezer a couple years ago, and I did not want to pay 70 bucks to have Lowe's transport it one mile to my house. My brother-in-law has a pickup truck, and I know that people who have pickup trucks get tired of people asking them to use the pickup truck. So what I normally would have done in the past is I would have said, hey, Scott, I got this freezer. I really want, if I could use a truck, I'll fill it up with gas. I won't put a ding in it. I really appreciate that. It helped me out a lot. But if you're too busy or if it's too inconvenient, don't worry about it, right? Because I don't want to be a heel or freeloader. I want to give him an out if he doesn't want to give me the truck. But the trick is just flip it. Make the last thing you say the positive request and use your, you know, default, you know, obligatory, you don't have to in the middle, in the beginning. So you, instead, I did say, Hey, Scott, I would love you to pick up truck and save me some money. If it's too inconvenient, that's totally fine. I don't mind at all. But if you would, I'd fill it up with gas and I really would appreciate it. Scientists say that you've got a more, they're more likely to say yes, not a guarantee, but just use that. It's a freebie. Increase your chances of getting your friends to say something 
it'll give you what you want, okay? Uh, repeat as needed. This is really important in the middle stage. Find different ways to repeat the same information. If they still can read well, write it down. Uh, we, I was at a support group and one day the wife came in and she was so excited. She was just like, I figured it out. This is the best thing ever. Do you know that they have little whiteboards that have magnets that you can put on the refrigerator? And I just wrote down the day of the week, the date, and then what we were doing that day. And every time he asked me, all I had to say was, it's on the whiteboard. Hey, check out the whiteboard. Oh, I wrote that on the whiteboard over there. Part of what makes us crazy about repeating the same answer is that if we have to say it the same way every single time, but if you can at least shake it up and say it differently and just point them to the whiteboard, that can help now not for everybody and not for the whole length of the whole disease but that can be something you can do like that okay uh, you want to turn negatives into positives much like what you do with kids if they have something they don't want to do find something that's enjoyable on the other side of that to try to help motivate them to go through and do it you know you're going to find that because they are literally traveling back in time then some of the tactics you're going to use may resemble things that you did with your kids when they were little. And that's just okay, that's just where they're at. Also, you wanna be aware though, um, a great example is taking a shower, getting cleaned up to go somewhere. Generally don't like to do it. Why do I have to take a shower? I just took one yesterday when in reality it's been a week, okay? Be aware that like with a shower, maybe for you, the temperature feels great, but for them it's scolding hot. Maybe for you, oh, that, the shower heads just it's just a nice beating so it feels good maybe for them it's like little knives stabbing them because they're more sensitive or maybe for them if you have to help them they don't who are you why you're not going to help me get a bath so there are a lot of things that can go into their resistance to do things so just be aware of that and try to put yourself in their shoes uh, for some of those things as well um, and then of course avoid quizzing you're not going to help their memory this is not one of those places where you can exercise their brain and it's going to make it easier for them. It's just going to frustrate them. It's going to frustrate you. I would like to say that maybe only little grandkids would play the game of, hey, if grandma remembers my name, then I'm the favorite one. But the truth is us adult children are the same. See, I was the golden child forever. And so yeah, I might be tempted to say, man, if mom remembers my name, I've solidified my place in the top of the hierarchy of the siblings. And my other siblings may be trying to knock me down off my high horse. Don't do that. The quizzing doesn't work and you're not going to help them. Okay. So, but giving multiple cues is a good overall way to go. Okay. Lots of things. So here's, this is sort of similar to what we had already said before, but what I want to show, focus on is focus on the feelings and not the facts. This is what we call therapeutic fibbing. It's a fancy scientific way to do something that you got smacked as to do if you were a kid. If you're a kid, you lie to mom or dad, you get in trouble. So you sort of ingrained that you don't wanna lie. You have to remember if they can't connect with reality, then don't worry about the facts of what's going on. Just connect with their feelings. That's what they need from you. They need to be safe and taken care of and they need to as best as you can, help them to be happy and at ease as best as you can. You won't do it perfectly all the time, okay? Here's another, it's not on the screen here, but um, it was about a couple of years ago. I was listening to this podcast. They were talking about staffing shortages for home health workers. Surprise, surprise, they're still having staffing shortages. But this, this CEO, of this big national um, home health agency was talking about how they love to hire college students for the non-medical home A work. And not just any college student, they love to hire theater majors to work with dementia patients. And I found that interesting. And then I remembered my sister was in theater and she did improv. And she told me that the rule, the rule of improv is to always say yes and. You never say no and you never contradict. And that's how improv goes. That's how, why it's funny. And that's how the gag keeps going. And these theater students loved it because every day working with a dementia patient was improv practice. As long as they're safe and they're, they're gonna try to go do things they can't do. That's just gonna happen sometimes. 
but find what you can say yes to. Say yes to that and then and and build on it. So it's a little bit like thinking about what I said before, addressing their needs and redirecting. But if you just remember, it's improv. So you get to be a detective. You get to advance your communication skills if you're a caregiver. Now you get to become a better improv person. Mm -hmm. All these things you get to do as a caregiver. Who knew? Um, but anyway, so that's just want to remember that. And always bringing that respect every time is also really important as well. Now, that was a lot. Any questions about that middle stage? And then we'll wrap up pretty quickly the late stage and take some more questions. Any questions so far? Yeah. What are these getting like three or four every time they say yes? <laughs> so either or answer, they say yes, because then at that point, either or is too much. Yeah. Um, so then you can even just, then you would say you want to do this or that. The, you can say, oh, they said yes. Oh, you want pizza? Yes. Okay, great. You know, you still gave them the choice if you just, in essence, just made the decision for them, but at least they feel like that. And that's a good point because sometimes they'll use that same word and that's not quite what it means. So Tipa Snow gives this example. Um, she's at a facility and working with this dear little lady and she walks up and she says, oh, it's time for lunch. Do you want to go to lunch? And she's going along and she goes, yes. So Tipa comes along, cuts her arm, is going to take her to lunch and the lady's fighting her. Yes. Yes, and she just wants, so yes, didn't mean yes, but it was something that she could say and she felt comfortable with, right? And that's a little bit, a little bit more in the late stage, okay? In that late stage, oh, I, hold on, there we go. Um, they'll respond to familiar words and phrases, but probably won't mean, just the communicating, it's fun for them to say, it still feels good to speak, it still feels good to hear people talking to them, but how much communication is going to happen? Not that much, maybe directly. Okay. Um, but at that place in the late stage is about connecting and finding any ways you can to connect, make them feel happy and safe. Bring that respect. Always keep talking. The key in the late stage is to use the five senses to communicate. And now I'm going to, at this point, say what we're about to cover, you can use throughout the entire process. Anywhere that you can include the five senses to make the event more interesting, it's going to be better, okay? And that also is an advanced communication thing. If you want someone to remember something that you're saying, use multiple senses. Um, and if you don't want to, I mean, like right now, you set the stage really great when you made some coffee and the room smell a little bit better. So that'll help with the atmosphere of this meeting room, okay? Also, you can use the kinds of, this is advanced, this isn't Alzheimer's, but if you want to communicate with more people, realize that there are different kinds of words that correspond to different senses. Do you see what I'm saying? Can you hear what I'm trying to get at? Does that ring a bell to you? Does that feel right to you? Each of those words correspond to a sense. And so if you can shake up and mix up those kinds of words you use, that is more avenues of connecting with people, okay? So again, just a little side tip, but it's about the senses. So let's just go over a few of them, okay? Each of the senses. So touch, the feel of different fabrics. We have fidget quilts at our office, and this is really helpful. They're little blankets that lay, different people sew together at churches and such zippers, pouches, different fields of fabric. And sometimes they like to sit there and just fiddle with it. And that helps them. And you can use that as a way for touch, okay? Identify shapes by touch. Now you don't quiz, that's not identify like quizzing, but it's like, oh, here's a block. Do you feel this block? Just talk to them. I remember when I was a kid and I had blocks. Did you have blocks in your kid? Man, I'm sure they were a lot of fun. Just a way to talk and let them play with it, right? You can give a lotion or a hand massage. I think, do you know Becky Cobb? Mm -hmm. So we know Becky, she's a reflexologist. Becky told me that your feet and your hands, they're the ends of your nervous system's points. And when you give a hand massage, you're not only making your hand feel good, you're sending signals back on these different nerves to your spine, which radiate out to your internal organs. So a hand massage is also a little full body massage. So just realize that's also nice if people don't mind a hand massage. 
Um, so playing, visiting animals or stuffed animals or a baby doll, they'll think it's a real baby. It's fantastic. Um, holding the person's hand or stroking their arm can just be a nice soothing way to connect, right? So all these little things for touch. Another way is sight. Um, laminating, looking at picture books together, okay? Watching videos of animals or nature. Why do you think every facility you walk in has either a fish tank or a birdcage in their main lobby area? It's just soothing to sit and watch those things, right? You can look at pictures of famous people from when they were younger and they can play that game and sometimes it'll trigger something, right? Um, but sit by an open window together. Now, what I love about this one is it touches on something that we Americans sort of forget. Now, this elder did not have dementia, but Native American culture is very different than Western white US culture. For one, they think we talk too much and they say we can't keep quiet for two seconds and we are go, 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 go all the time. So this guy said, okay, I'm gonna try to have a better visit. He sat down 45 minutes, said three things maybe, like, oh, look at that bird. 45 minutes, hardly said a word. He got up to leave, the native elder looked at him and said, thank you. That was one of the nicest visits I've had. and being present with someone. And that's a really cool thing. So don't diminish that. Just sitting and being present with somebody. If they have dementia or if they don't, it's just all true, okay? So sight. Now sound, I think everyone pretty classically knows music and dementia, how music stays with people who have dementia much longer than most anything does, okay? So familiar music is a really good tool. Usually, I, a, re, a music therapist told me once that it's like the courting years, 14 to 24. Those are the years that, that music gets imprinted in a different part of our brain. And I, I, I've got my bands that I still like from those years. And it's funny, those bands have went on to make newer music. I don't like their newer music. I like the music that's recorded in my brain from when I was in that age, right? So when I'm in the nursing home, ACDC, Bon Jovi, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Um, but just that music, if they played an instrument a lot, they can still go do it. We've, I think most of us have seen and heard about Tony Bennett in the final concert he did with Lady Gaga. Went up perfectly, performed an entire show. Next day, completely didn't have any clue that he did that. So that music is just there. So listening to that music, recording sounds of animals or farm music or instrumental, instrumental music or speech of a native language or scripture that's meaningful or poetry that they enjoy, or even just reading them the newspaper in a nice relaxing way. That's a way to connect and be there with them through sound. Then you have smell, um, herbs, spices, coffee, the smell of coffee, a little taste of coffee, that's always good. Um, grass clippings, lavender we know is relaxing, but essential oils in a cotton ball can be really nice. Um, and then maybe cook something in the room that can smell really good. And then you can do some taste as well, always being mindful of choking hazard, where are they at? Because by the late stage, they're not gonna be eating as much and their ability to swallow is gonna be affected. But even just a little bit, you know, so my father-in-law, Jamocha almond fudge ice cream and Pepsi. Now the girl, my kids love to visit grandpa because we got him some every time and he loved to share. He took a bite, he felt great, and they got the rest of it. It was wonderful, okay? But favorite drinks, pops, puddings, let them enjoy that, just connect with that, okay? So that's just some late stage things. So here's just you know a review, join them where they're at, um, understand what you can't change, just there are things you're gonna have to let go of and not worry about. One of our community educators and board members, he had a wife, his wife who passed away, had younger onset, she was in her mid 50s and got Alzheimer's. He told me about the time she loved meatball sandwiches and she wanted to go to the restaurant and eat a meatball sandwich. And he was mortified because it was not a pretty sight when she would eat this meatball sandwich. But he got to the place where he said he didn't care. He's like, you know what? 
She doesn't mind being a mess. She's enjoying eating it. So what? Let it go, right? So always treat them like the adult, demonstrate respect. Always remember the mood of your actions on there um, and try to meet their needs while soothing them and being calm in presence. Just a few overviews. So that's a lot. It's a lot about communication and a lot of things that you can do to help bridge that gap and where they can't meet you. So you can still connect, still work with them, okay? Any questions? And then I'll do a minute about resources that we have. But any other questions? Symptoms that you have on one list, and then at a different stage, yeah, so they cross over. Stages are fluid, it's it usually it's never like a clean, oh, we've entered the middle stage today. No, it's like sometimes verbally they'll be really and it it moves, so eventually it, you'll sort of know that okay, we're really sort of here in the middle stage, and but any given day, symptoms will change, and then different weight, it's, it's fluid, yeah. So you have to be ready for that. And what worked today may not work tomorrow, but it may work two months from now. So keep a list of what works because you never know when it's gonna work again. <laughs> um, any other questions? So real quick, the Alzheimer's Association, um, we are the leading nonprofit in the world of dementia, where our goal is to eliminate Alzheimer's disease and all other dementia. It's not just about Alzheimer's, but it's the biggest one. So that's the one we focus on the most. There's a lot of online resources at alz.org. Ways, if you're a caregiver, to find help. All's Connected is great. It's like an online message board slash support group. So if you're at your wits end, you've tried it all, and what in the world do I do next? Go to All's Connected, create a profile, and you know how that goes. And then search for your question. Chances are a lot of people have asked the same question or answer the question, you're, ask it yourself. And people from all over the country who are caregivers will share what they've learned. So that's a great way to crowdsource caregiving struggle. Um, we also have you know, safety center. We have stuff in the community. We have support groups for caregivers that meet. We have education programs like this. We have education programs like this online. We have a lot of other programs besides this one. We have a walk every year that helps raise funds, but that walk is also a great place for you to come together and see you're not alone. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in the Peoria area come to the walk, okay? Um, yeah, there's a lot of other things. So that's, and we do other things, advocacy, state government, federal government, uh, things like that too, so. Any other questions? about the disease in general. Thanks to the people that joined us online in recording. We'll